Well, hello. <clears throat> it's flu philosophy roulette number 99. I am almost at three digits. It's sort of amazing. For a quarantine project, I've done it quite a bit. So, what we do is we get philosophy papers and we read them live on air. Please send me something if you, have, if you want me to read something. Otherwise, I just grab whatever Phil Papers has, recent or whatever I feel like looking at, really. But it's roulette. I don't know what I'm going to get. So, here we go. I'm doing a bunch of uh, biomedical ethics and stuff like that. Seems to be, um, it's published. There's been a bunch of that publishing. Oh, you did AI and society also. I should have had it's a little bit. Yeah, see more bioethics. Ooh, analysis. Let's see if explanatory perfectionism is there. I always like analysis and thought papers. They are less long than other papers. Nope. All right, so let's see. Let's see if anything else is forthcoming. It's just an excuse for me to read analysis papers, which I like to do. All right, I've read all of these. I don't think I did literal self-deception, but I just don't think it's available. You can always check again. Hmm. Let's see what else is there. Because like I said, I have read most of these. I'm gonna have read everything in analysis and thought for the last like two years or something at this point. Empty, see that? You should send your, you should upload a copy of your stuff, people, that way I can read it. Um, I think I read this. I can't even remember what I've read anymore. Uh, this was nice, this recent work on physicalism. Uh, let's see, let's make, no, this is probably a review. Let's see. Don't think that's theirs. We read this uh, object files. Let's see, basic course and probability theory. It's a review. These are reviews by uh, grounding grounds necessity. Did we do this? Uh, I think we might have. I don't even know at this point. Uh, let's see if there's something else. Hmm. 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 An argument for entity grounding. Don't know what that is. Yeah, there was a bunch of uh, grounding stuff coming out. So. Nope. Nope. That's sad. Not available. That's very sad. Okay, let's go see if I... Transparency and self-knowledge, then, perhaps. Let's see what is available. Oh, that's so sad. Also not available. Uh, let's see. Anything else right here? Survey analysis. I don't like reading science-y things, because it's hard to read. Oh, well, I'm gonna go to thought soon. Take that analysis. Nope, read that one already. All right, I read all the analysis papers. Wow, nearly all of them. Sort of amazing. It's like I could go like 2016 or something. Oh. So, what do we want to read here from this year? How propaganda works. Hmm. <laughs> what else we got? Uh, all implies can. Pika on primitive self representation. They say content and the hink. I don't know what the hink is. Let's go see if I can find out what the hink is. Uh, intuitions, Timothy Williamson, 
These are our reviews. A solution to the paradox of analysis. In analysis, that's kind of exciting. So let's see what that is. All right, if it's, I want to know about this, so let's read this one if it's available. Woo! Thank you, 2016 paper. All right, so this is what we're going to do. So this is a solution to the paradox of analysis in analysis. If you want to grab the uh, link, I'm going to throw it in the show notes. I mean, the, uh, well, I will throw it in the show notes too, but it's in the chat box and you can grab it by typing exclamation paper uh, and it will pop back up for you. Uh, did I hit download yet? Must have. Cool. Okay, here we go. So, uh, Solution to the Paradox of Analysis by Mark Balag Balaguer and Terry, Ho Terry Horgan. <coughs> when one does conceptual analysis, one asks questions like, what is knowledge? What is free will? What is a person? And so on. When one answers these questions, one says things like, knowledge is justified through... No, I never say that. Don't ever say that. That's a bad thing to say. I mean, people do say this, but don't say this. That's bad. Right, they might also say, a person is a thinking, conscious being with a memory of itself existing over time. Or, to give a trivial example, a bachelor is an unmarried man. The paradox of analysis asks how the answer to conceptual analysis question, that is, a conceptual analysis or a sentence like B, could be simultaneously true and informative. If a conceptual analysis is true, then it should capture the meaning of the term in, term in question and so it should be analytic. But if it's an analytic, how could it be informative? In this article, we will propose a solution to this paradox. The solution will be based on the idea that when a conceptual analysis is true, there is an important sense in which it is both analytic and empirical. Now, lest you think us mad, we hasten to add that there's also an important sense in which such sentences are a priori. But the sense in which they are empirical will be enough to provide a solution to the paradox of analysis. Okay, so they're, they're trying to square the circle here. It's a priori and uh, empirical. All right, let's see how they do this one. This is what I want to read. I was like, I want to see. I mean, you have to, if you're going to say you're going to do this, is basically you're going to say two like uh, very contrary things very quickly. And, well, they, at least they said it so they're honest people. <laughs> the, fir the first point we want to make here is that conceptual analysis questions, that is questions like what is free will, what is a person, and so on, are semantic questions. In particular, questions about meaning. The question what is free, mil <laughs> free, mil free will is essentially equivalent to the question what, is, what concept is expressed by the expression free will, more simply taking concepts to be meanings, what is the meaning of free will. If you like, you can think of it this way. In Platonic heaven, all the different concepts of free freedom exist side by side. For example, here is Hume's freedom, libertarian freedom, Frankfurt free, freedom, and so on. When one asks what is free will, one is asking which of these concepts is the concept of free will. But that is just to ask which of them is picked out by the expression free will. And again, taking concepts to be meanings, this is just to ask what the meaning of free will is. These remarks hold even if the term in question is a rigid designator like water. The answer to the conceptual analysis question about water is not that water is H2O, is that water is a rigid designator that picks out a certain substance out of our acquaintance, namely the watery stuff in our acquaintance. More precisely, following Chalmers 96 and Jackson 98, the answer to conceptual analysis question about water is that water, in parentheses, expresses the concept the actual watery stuff of our acquaintance. Thus, even when the term is rigid, the conceptual analysis question can be thought of as a question about meaning. Okay. <coughs> there is also an important distinction to be made between two senses of, of the term concept. We will disambiguate by using the expressions Platonist concept and psychological concept. The Platonist concept associated with the expression is an, an abstract entity, in particular a meaning. This is the sense in which we used the expression above. The psychological concept associated with an expression is a psychological entity that figures as a constituent of intentional mental states. All right, see, this is the problem. I don't actually know what, I know what you mean by this stuff, but I don't actually 
I know what like philosophers are talking about when they say this, but like I don't actually understand any of like what a con constitutional of an intentional mental state is is I think what people argue over. So I'm not exactly sure what that comes down to. But anyway, this is fine because they all say you can do this. I just don't know how it happens. In general, the psychological concept is heard with a word expresses the same Platonistic concept that the word expresses as long as the person in question is competent in using the expression and uses it like the other members of the linguistic community do. The appropriate way to individuate psychological concepts, for present purposes at least, is in terms of the Platonistic concepts that they express. That is, the Platonistic concepts that are the meanings of the corresponding words. So we're, this is a Platonistic theory then, because basically it's all coming down to Platonistic concepts. So a psychological concept possessed by one person counts as the same or of the same kind as one possessed by another person, just in case both psychological concepts express the same Platonistic concepts. Hereafter, we will adopt the, con the convention of using capital letters to denote psychological concepts and italics to denote Platonistic concepts, as in the, psycholo the psychological concept PAC bachelor, all caps, and the Platonistic concept bachelor, lower caps, lowercase italic okay but i mean it looks like uh this they're just going to be giving a platonistic analysis of this because um the psychological co uh, concept has to do with a uh, competence um and when it when one when the author is competent then the psychological concept just reduces the, the platonist one but of course there is differences between people and then you can have psychological differences but it, as long as they are like in some sense right then it's all Platonistic. Yeah. Okay. So, here we go. Um, yeah, down here. Given all this, we can say that when one does conceptual analysis, one is trying to ascertain which Platonistic concept is expressed by the given psychological concept in the associated linguistic expression. So an analysis is correct if and only if it captures the right Platonistic concept. For instance, suppose one is trying to an analyze the concept of bachelor, and suppose one proposes the following answer, a bachelor is an unmarried man. The question whether this analysis is correct depends on whether following is true. B star. The psychological concept bachelor, that's all caps, and the un English word bachelor, lower caps, no italic, express the Platonistic concept unmarried man. Or equivalently, the Platonistic concept italics bachelor is numerically identical to the Platonist concept unmarried man. You might wonder whether, when one does conceptual analysis, one is analyzing the psychological concept or the Platonistic concept. You can think about it either way. The part of B star that's not in parentheses gives the sense in which one is analyzing the psychological concept, whereas the part in parentheses gives the sense in which one is analyzing the Platonistic concept. Okay, so up here we got the bachelor and this is just the um, psychological thing. Um, that comes down to the Platonist concept, or you're analyzing the Platonist concept only here in terms of unmarried man. So the concept bachelor. All right. Um, I guess that's okay. There's no nothing wrong with the way they're setting this up. I mean, you just have to sort of swallow the Platonism if you're not a Platonist. Now to the business at hand. We need to explain why it is that some conceptual analyses are obvious and some are not. Compare B with the following libertarian analysis of free will, L. A person, P, has free will if and only if, A, at least some of P's decisions are stimula- are si <laughs> excuse me, are simultaneously unde undetermined and non-random, and B, the indeterminacy in question generates or increases the non-randomness. Suppose that L and B are both correct. Why is B obvious and L non-obvious? The reason we suggest is that for some psychological concepts and expressions, for example, the psychological concept bachelor and the expression not the psychological bachelor, the ordinary, um, ordinary competent speakers have explicit knowledge of their meanings, whereas for other psychological concepts and expressions, for example, free will and free will, psychological and non-psychological, ordinary competent speakers have mere implicit knowledge of their meanings. So explicit versus implicit knowledge. It is simply a fact about confident speakers of natural language that they can be very proficient with a term, that is, they know how they know when a, the term applies and does not apply, even if they can't define the term. In such cases, the speakers in question have mere implicit knowledge of the meaning of the term. Okay, so it's 
background knowledge that matters here? I'm not sure, we'll have to keep going. There is a corresponding distinction to be drawn between two kinds of competence regarding psychological concept and the associated expression. We will call Platonistic competence, what we will call Platonistic competence is explicit knowledge of which Platonist, Platonistic concept is expressed by the psychological concept and the expression. Okay. I don't know what a Platonist, I don't, how am I a, pla a co plate, how am I platonically competent? I mean, do I have access to the world of forms? I don't have the access to the world of forms. I don't believe in the world of forms. Well, maybe I have access to it. I just don't know about it. So here's a question about what actually, how do you get to be platonically competent? I mean, I'm not Plato. I don't know. I don't have access to the world of forms. Maybe you do, but I'm a little worried about this right here. In contrast, what we will call application competence is the ability to correctly apply the psychological comp concept and the expression in particular cases, modulo one's available evidence. That is the ability to know what things are instances of the concept and what things are not in suitably wide range of cases. So this is sort of like family resemblance of this stuff. When you can apply it and what counts as something when it doesn't. Given this distinction, the point of the preceding paragraph can be put in the following way. Ordinary con conceptual and linguistic competence, that is ordinary knowledge of meaning and ordinary knowledge of the meaning of a psychological concept and associated expression requires only application competence, not platonic competence. In other words, ordinary comp competence requires only implicit knowledge of meaning, not explicit knowledge. This explains why analysis can be informative and thereby explains away the putative paradox of analysis. Okay, so in other words, we just don't have all the platonic data and so we can use concepts sort of roughly and then it's just explicating, maybe. There is another side to the story that drives our point home even more. Namely, there is that there is an important sense in which a correct conceptual analysis is both analytic and empirical. To appreciate this, consider the following, following roughly Humean analysis of the concept of free will. H, free will is the ability to, to act in accordance with your desires. If H is true, then it is analytic. But whether H is true depends on whether the following claims are true. Excuse me. The psychological concept of free will expresses the platonic concept, the ability to act in accordance with your desires. H2. The English expression free will expresses the platonic concept, the ability to act in accordance with your desires. Um, okay, so psychological and platonic. Alright, and English versus psychological. But now notice that while H is analytic, if it is true, H2 is clearly empirical. The expression free will could have meant almost anything in English. It could have expressed the platonic concept yellow flower or no concept at all. In addition, we claim that H1 is empirical too. One argument for this is that one can use the same empirical methodology to discover the truth of both H1 and H2, specifically the methodology of conceptual analysis. Here is why conceptual analysis is properly understood as empirical. Since as a competent speaker, one is good at knowing what, when the psychological concept and corresponding expression apply and when they do not, one can use one's intuitions and when they do and don't apply as data points and one can use these data points to confirm or falsify empirical hypotheses about what the psychological concept and the expression mean. So you, given your experience, you can narrow down what you think your terms mean, if it's psychological or just an English expression. Okay. Um, but I mean, again, narrow down how there's no guarantee that you're getting closer to the truth or platonic heaven as it were um so how do you know you're narrowing it down in terms of the correct conceptual analysis you'd have to have some sort of um corrective some sort of correct like yeah how would you know when you're right and there this is this wouldn't there's no guarantee that you're getting the correct conceptual analysis there's no guarantee that you're getting to the uh, world of forms, of platonic forms. So, um, again, if you're a Platonist, maybe this is great, but I'm not a Platonist, and so it's a little concerning to me. Okay. Anywho, moving on. Thus, we have the result that whether H provides the correct analysis of free will depends on whether the empirical, empirical claims H1 and H2 are true. Moreover, this point can be generalized. For any attempted conceptual analysis, CA, the question whether CA is correct turns on the question whether the corresponding empirical claims about the meaning of the psychological concept and the associated expression are true. 
Okay, so if your analysis is good, then you have to make sure this is true. How do you know it's true? How do you know your claims are true? I don't know. And this provides a second way of appreciating why conceptual analysis can be informative, specifically because claims about the meaning of one psychological concepts, expressions, are empirical. But what are you comparing them to? When we combine this with the fact that our knowledge of these meanings can be merely implicit, it is no wonder that claims about meaning can be informative. Um, yeah. If you assumed that there was some way to correct, like, to get it wrong and then fix it, that had something to do with the reality of the platonic form, then yes, but how do you, I mean, being informative of what? Not the platonic form, because how would you know when you're wrong? Okay. I should st stop harping the point right now. We will end by responding to two words. First, why does conceptual analysis seem a priori if it is really empirical? The reason is that when one does conceptual analysis, one has first person epistemic access to important data points, namely one's intuitions, and this is why conceptual analysis can be carried out in the proverbial armchair. Classify such a, oh, these folks classify such empirically informed inquiry and knowledge as low grade a priori. Yeah, so you're really just uh, reviewing your what you know, and by like collating what you know, then you can actually get some of this uh, narrow down the psychological empirical data that you have and get results. That's fine. Yeah. Second, as emphasized already, if H is true, then it is analytic. But if it is analytic, then it is presumably a priori. How then could it depend for its truth on the empirical claims H1 and H2? This puzzle can be solved by clarifying what it means to say that a sense is a priori. Here are three different ways to define a priori for sentences. A sentence S is strong a priori if and only if one can know a priori that S is true without prior knowledge of what S means. So it's like a tautology. S is medium a priori if one can know a priori that S is true given only implicit knowledge of what the words in S means, so it is sort of, it's reducible to the terms, and therefore you can know what the, um, yeah, given the definitions, you can put together and understand what S means, so that's medium, and S is weak a priori, if and only if one can a priori know a priori that S is true, given explicit knowledge of what the word, the words in S means, alright, so what's the difference between the words in S mean, given explicit knowledge, okay, so there's the implicit knowledge and explicit knowledge, okay. It should be obvious that one, no sentences are strong a priori. No, I mean only tautologies are strong a priori in this sense. And two, ordinarily when philosophers say that some sentence is a priori, they do not mean that it is strong a priori. Now, we admit that if H is true and hence analytic, then it is a priori in some sense. But given our discussion above, the right thing to say about H is that it is only weak a priori, not medium a priori or strong a priori. And this is entirely consistent with it's depending for its truth on the empirical claims of H1 and H2. Okay, I think this last little bit's kind of interesting because um, if you have to do some like mental work to figure out what a term means, even based on its definitions, because you have to like sort of interrogate your understanding of the terms in the definition, then you are doing work to understand what the term means. Um, so there is some work being done there. That doesn't mean that what you're interrogating in your head is getting the right word. It's just interrogating your experience, and your experience might be bad experience. And so it may not get the right term for what it means. It just means what you have experienced in some sense. Okay, so that's my the crux of my basic complaint with this, is that I'm not Platonist, and I don't think we have access to this stuff. And so there's no correction if we're just getting everything terribly wrong. We're not actually accessing the, plat the platonic uh, forms in any way. Um, otherwise, this was a nice paper, otherwise. I mean, they set out to do something that's basically impossible, um, which is the solve a paradox of analysis. And they did get, it looks like they got somewhere by breaking up a priori into different things. I don't know if it was successful for the reasons I said, but by sh this last little bit here, this sort of, um, different sort of different grades of a priori and that you do need to do conceptual work in some of them to get somewhere that does sort of show that there is um you, that they they have um 
that there might be more to this. Um, if like there there was more to be said about how this conceptual work and maybe corrective work would go, like how you can correct our understanding of the forms. So that would be about it. Um, let's see, anything else to be said about this? Um, yeah, and also, oh, yeah, this complaint I had about psychological stuff, that's fine, really. I mean, that's just sort of a given in this uh, area. I mean, they, they don't have to argue for that. It's just sort of how things go. Um, also, so, yeah, I guess that's about it. I mean, it depends on how you're breaking up your sort of metaphysics here, but um, given a like sort of a Platonist background, this is a nice paper, and uh, it's uh, good. So I guess that's it. Unless the viewers have any questions, I guess that's it for now. Kind of a short day today. I had a short paper this morning and another short one now. Um, but hey, tomorrow's gonna be number 100. I got to 100 of these things, so we've got plenty of a back catalog if you want to watch me analyze more stuff and I'll be back tomorrow morning I think 10 30 a.m. in the eastern daylight time zone y you can check the calendar for what um, it is in your zone so have a good day and uh, thanks for watching stay safe y'all